Amen. Go ahead and be seated. I invite you to turn in your Bibles to Isaiah chapter 6. We're going to be looking at verses 1 through 6 this morning. Um, and so last week when we were looking at 2 Chronicles chapter 20, we saw one of the first things that Jehoshaphat does is he, he seeks the Lord. Um, and as I started thinking about that, um, what does it mean to seek the Lord? Um, when we when we talk about that, that can be a very easily just a, a phrase that we use. I'm, I'm going to seek the Lord. I'm going to seek. There's a dead spot right there. So um, I'm going to seek the Lord, and yet um, that's that's an essential aspect in our relationship with God. We're told in Scripture that uh, we draw near unto God, and He will draw near unto us. We're told that we're to enter uh, his courts. We're told to go to his presence. We're told that we're to seek his face, seek understanding of him, seek deeper relationship with him. We are to seek God. And yet at the same time, in our text this morning, what we find is that's an incredibly terrifying prospect. To seek God means you might actually find him. And when you find him, you're confronted with someone that is utterly holy, someone that is utterly separate, And when you seek God, you encounter him as he actually is. When we seek God, we encounter him, and we not only encounter him, but we encounter and are confronted with how far short we fall of his absolute purity and perfection. And that leads into a place of inadequacy and repentance. What we see in our text this morning is that... um, Uh, A prominent figure in the Bible, Isaiah, one that God used in mighty ways, started off at this place of confronting God and being confronted by God. This is the guy that prophesied about the new covenant and the coming Messiah, and yet he was also a sinful man, an inadequate man, when uh, compared to the perfection of the glory of God. And what we see is that God's grace actually works through this entire thing and brings about a particular result. And so all of this, as we will see today, is by God's sovereign grace. We sing the song, grace, grace, God's grace, grace that can pardon the guilt within, grace, grace, God's grace, grace that will cleanse me of all my sin. And then we, we live in this perpetual state of guilt. For some people, we live in a perpetual state of feeling condemned. And so the question must be asked, uh, either we don't really understand God's grace or we're not appropriating it in the right ways. Maybe we're, we're assuming on it or, or presuming upon it and, and we haven't really followed through these sort of steps that we see in this text that lead to that place of uh, a clear conscience and sin being removed. So what we'll see today is just thoroughly through and through God's grace at work, but it's at work in three different ways in this text. And and those three different ways sort of have a progression. So uh, let's read Isaiah chapter 6, verses 1 through 6. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting upon his throne high and lifted up, And the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him stood a seraphim, and each each had six wings. With two he covered his face, and with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. And one called to the other and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the foundations of the thresholds shook at the voice of him who called. And the house was filled with smoke. And I said, woe is me, for I am lost. For I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of people of unclean lips. My eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. One of the seraphim flew to me, having in his hand a burning coal that he had taken with tongs from the altar. And he touched my mouth and said, behold, This has touched your lips, your guilt is taken away, and your sin is atoned for. The first way we see grace at work in this text is grace reveals God. We see that in verses 1 through 4. Isaiah says that he um, saw the Lord sitting upon his throne high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. 
He saw him on this massive throne and saw the, um, the seraphim flying all around him, praising him, glorifying him. Now, seraphim, I found this out this week. Seraphim means uh, something on fire in Hebrew. So just let that picture, okay, not, uh, not precious moments, right? Sitting on your grandma's um, shelf. That's not what we're talking about here. These are not cute little naked babies with uh, wings on their backs. Uh, not like these little Cupid angels. These are like, I don't know what they look like. We don't have a description of them. All we know is what their name says. And they're apparently these flaming beasts that have six wings and are flying all around and are yelling at each other so loud that everything is shaking all around Isaiah. So this is the context. And, and they're flying around this massive throne and God is seated upon his throne and the train of his robe is so massive that it fills the entire temple and there's smoke everywhere. Right? Um... This is the picture that Isaiah gets. And, and these, these seraphim are yelling at one another, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is filled with his glory. And so these are really terrible creatures, something that would terrify you and I if we saw them and would really be the center of attention if they walked into this room right now. Right, imagine that. We're sitting here, everything's cool. We're having a little conversation, and in walks a seraphim flaming on fire, causing the, the carpet to light up as he walks and or flies, and uh, has, has six wings and is yelling so loud that the entire the, the floors and the walls are shaking. Okay, that, that, that would probably cause us to pause for a moment. And yet, the entire point of these creatures is that they're not the center of attention. These creatures are calling out to one another, pay attention to him. This is who we exist for. This Lord of hosts who has the whole earth full of his glory, they are pointing away from themselves and to God, their creator. He is the one that is holy. And that is the descriptor that they use three times. It's kind of like a Hebrew exclamation mark. They don't have exclamation marks. So if they say something three times, like when Jesus says, verily, verily, I say unto you, he's like, really pay attention. Truly, truly, I say, I'm really being honest. You need to, you need to listen up. When it happens three times, that's a really big deal. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. That is who God is. He is distinct. He is other. He is utterly different. So how do you comprehend something or someone who is utterly different? That's kind of an important question to ask. If holy is the idea of being separate, of being different, of being distinct, how in the world can we, who are incredibly ordinary, even though we have distinctions between each of us and uniquenesses between each of us, we're all pretty much kind of the same. How can we comprehend a being that is totally, utterly, completely different from us. And the only way is if this utterly distinct person is revealed, if, if he shows up as he is and shows us who he is. So imagine what you think of. Like, what do you think of when you hear the word aliens? Now, I'm not, comp- I'm not saying that God is an alien or comparing God to aliens, but it's the only thing I can think of that would be like this. So imagine that there are actually aliens and and one of them shows up. And we all have an inherited uh, sort of cultural tradition of what aliens might look like or what they might be like. You kind of got the the big egg-shaped head with the slanted weird eyeballs and the tiny little mouth and the the super skinny little body with the like little wrangly arms that come out and, and, and webbed feet or whatever, big... E.T. finger, you know, that lights up, or maybe me, and it's more like a Star Trek motif, you know, pointed ears and very logical and and scientifically advanced, uh, but kind of humanoid, you know. Um, Even in our culturally transmitted ideas of aliens, we see them as different, but imagine if aliens actually existed, what it would be like to see one for the first time. The point is that they would be so different, so other than us, 
that they would look nothing like we ever imagined. And they would be so distinct and so other that we would not be able to relate to them. That's pretty much the basis of every sort of big alien movie. There's this movie called The Arrival where these aliens show up and they communicate in such a different way. It's, it's so unique that no human being would have ever thought about it, thought to communicate that way. And they have to try to figure out how to communicate with these beings because they're so different, so distinct, so other. They would have to reveal themselves in a way that we could relate to. And so God is holy. He is other, meaning he is totally incomprehensible and unimaginable. And in order for us to comprehend and know him, he must reveal himself to us. He must show himself to us. The unknowable God can be known. The incomprehensible God can be apprehended, but not apart from him revealing himself to us, not apart from him showing himself to us. Now, God reveals himself in three different ways, or in, in, in many different ways, but there are three major ones. The first one he, is he reveals himself in creation. We kind of see that hinted at in this text. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is filled with his glory. That's kind of like uh, Psalm chapter 19. The heavens are telling of the glory of God. The earth proclaim his handiwork. It's affirmed again in Romans chapter 1 where it says the, uh, that God has revealed himself and the things that are made, his invisible attributes, namely his divine nature and eternal power, have been shown and clearly perceived in the things that are made so that man is without excuse. So the seraphim affirm things that are said elsewhere in Scripture. And so the heavens are telling of the God. The heavens are telling of the glory of God. The creation is putting his attributes on display. And the aim is that we would seek him and that we would um, come to him as he reveals that he is, for example, powerful, a creator, a sustainer, wise, orderly. These are things that we can understand by just looking at creation. But that's not enough because Romans tells us that that's not enough to save. It's only enough to condemn. It's only enough to affirm that there is a God, but not enough to save us from the wrath of this God because we've rebelled against him. So there's a second way in which God reveals himself, and that is through the Bible. He reveals himself through his word. And this entire book that we open every week is revealing who God is and what he is up to. It's not primarily about you and I, though it does have... um, some explanation of what went wrong with humanity and how we should live and in order to flourish and all of those things are true. But all of this book is aimed at revealing the God who made us. Now think about this. Every single description of the corruption of man is meant to highlight our separation from God because he is good and we are not. Every instruction for how to live highlights God's absolute perfection and our constant need for him. And there are these explicit interactions of God with humanity that are recorded in which we get to peer behind the curtain, as it were, and behold this God who is utterly different. Which means that who God is and how we understand God should be shaped by the Bible, because it is him revealing himself to us for us to behold. So the Bible gives us a more complete and special revelation, and it shows us his interactions with humanity and reveals him in those interactions as they're recorded. But there's a final way that God reveals himself, and that is in Christ. Christ, truly God, truly man, is the bridge between us and God. Now, here's what I mean by that. God is totally holy. He is totally separate. He is totally other. We are created. We are finite. We are mortal. We cannot comprehend this God. So he reveals himself in creation to show certain attributes that he has. He reveals himself in his interaction in history and shows different aspects of his character and his power and all of these other things. It tells us explicit things about him. And then... As the climax of all of that, he incarnates his holiness in a person. 
Christ incarnates God's glory and holiness so that we can relate to him. You cannot relate to a God who is spirit when all you know is flesh. You cannot relate to a God who is all-powerful when all you know is weakness. And so Jesus becomes flesh, truly God and truly man, revealing God in his fullness to us in a way that we can comprehend. It's not just this ethereal idea. It's flesh and blood. It's God's holiness walking on earth with sinful people and accomplishing his purposes. It's God putting himself on display in the person and work of Christ so that we might know him and understand him and relate to him. And that he might sympathize with us. That's what the writer of Hebrews says. Since we have a high priest who has entered into the holy places, let us approach the throne of grace with confidence, for we don't have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with us, but one who has been tested in every way, yet without sin. Therefore, let us go to him. So the point is that Jesus can relate to us, but never sinned like us. He retained all of the characteristics of God's holiness while taking on all of the weaknesses of humanity so that the two might be joined together in one person and that we might know God through Christ. Christ is the manifestation of God's glory in the flesh. And so God, here's the point, God is gracious in revealing himself. He is gracious in revealing himself in creation. He is gracious in preserving this word for us that reveals who he is. He is gracious in sending his son Christ to reveal himself to us in a way that we can relate to. And so if God is hidden, he is hidden by our sin, but he's also kind of hidden in plain sight, so to speak. He's always there. It's very clear. It's not a mystery to be solved. He, he's, he's easy to find because he is always there. You can't walk outside. You can't be in this room without knowing that God exists and knowing that he is there because everything in this creation is telling of that. It's gracious. It's good. It's kind. You can't open this book and say that God is hiding himself from you because he's revealing himself here. You can't look at Christ and say that God can't be found because God came to find us. When we have spiritual eyes to see, it is clear that he is there and he has always been there. So just think for a moment how gracious it is that God reveals himself to us. Because were he not to do that, were he not to take the initiative, we would never know him. That is an act of pure grace that God reveals himself. That Isaiah sees God there on his throne. That the, that the seraphim are calling attention to him and away from themselves. That is God's grace. And when God reveals himself to us in Christ in a way that we can actually relate to, when we see Christ, we get a glimpse of the gloriness of God incarnated so that we can know and understand him better. Jesus could have very easily just showed up, died, gone to heaven. Yet he lived for 33 years, truly God and truly man, so that we might know God better. It's his grace at work. But not only does his grace reveal himself, but it produces the right reaction. So the second thing we see is that grace produces repentance and confession. We see that in verse 5. Look at Isaiah's response. So he, he, he sees the Lord. He sees the robe. He sees the smoke. He sees the seraphim. He feels the ground shaking. He hears these angels screaming at one another to point to God, right? That word is not just like saying like, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. It's like they're screaming it. It is, it is loud and shaky and scary in this throne room. And Isaiah, when he sees God, what happens? Look at verse five. And I said, woe is me, for I am lost. 
For I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Now, before we get into this, I just want you to notice something. God doesn't say anything. Just marinate on that for a second. God does not say, Isaiah, have you sinned? God does not say, Isaiah, are your lips clean? Isaiah, are you worthy to be here? Have you done the right stuff? Have you kept up with the Joneses? Have you, have you accomplished everything that I have commanded without fail? You see, when, when Isaiah is confronted with God in all of his splendor, in all of his holiness, in all of his majesty, in all of his glory, God doesn't have to say anything. There's no accusation. Isaiah's own conscience condemns him because he has seen the standard by which everything else is measured. He is confronted with holiness and he can't hide. And so understanding that God is holy causes us to see something in ourselves, right? When we see God's holiness, we see our unholiness. And rather than trying to hide it, which he knows he cannot do, Isaiah just lays it all bare. Look at how Isaiah responds when he's confronted by this holy God. He says, woe is me. That's a pronouncement of a curse. It's basically, I'm damned. Why? Because I'm a man of unclean lips. Now, why is that significant? It's significant because at the end of the verse, he says, I have seen the king, the Lord of hosts. You see, it's seeing God that causes Isaiah to be confronted with his own unworthiness and confess his own sin in repentance. That's what does it. Nothing else. And and when Isaiah says, I'm a man of unclean lips, it's not so much the behavior but the heart attitude that led to it. The sinful action flows out of the sinful heart, and the desires which stand in contrast to the absolute purity of God are exposed. He doesn't doesn't say, I said unclean words, right? He doesn't say, I had a potty mouth. I said some swear words. I said bad words. It's an unclean heart that produced unclean fruit. My lips speak from the overflow of my heart. The holiness of God is not just an issue of action, though it includes that. God's holy actions issue from his holy character and heart. And Isaiah realizes this and realizes the unholiness of his own heart and the deep source within him that produces bad things. Things that are an affront to God. And by the way, that's what makes them bad. They they stand in contrast to God's holiness. They don't align with God's holiness. That's the definition of sin. It's not just I've got a list of things that are bad. It's I've got attitudes in my heart that are wrong. You can say really nice things and be totally not right with God. Like Nebraska nice is a thing. Didn't know it till we moved here, but it's a thing. And there are people with very unclean hearts that can say very clean things. So Isaiah is not so much focusing on what he's said, but the heart behind it, the fact that he has unclean lips from an unclean heart. Though it may be manifested in external things, that's never really actually the issue, but rather a necessary and unavoidable consequence of the inner problem of corruption. And, and here's the thing, that inner problem of corruption is something that Isaiah is utterly powerless to change. Same with you and me. Paul talks about this, the New Testament talks about this, Jesus talks about this, so out of our heart flow our words. And so when Paul says, stop slandering, stop gossiping, stop gossiping, have pure speech, what he's really saying is 
Have a pure heart. Have a right attitude. Because out of our heart, all of this other stuff comes up. I'm sure Isaiah could give some really good reasons or excuses for his uh, um, unclean lips if he was talking to you or I. He could probably justify in certain circumstances why he had was a man of unclean lips. In fact, he might not have actually really even considered that he was a man of unclean lips if he was confronted with you or I, if it was just us hanging out. He might actually not have been aware of that because we're all like that. I mean, sure, we can sit there and like, nitpick and say, I'm a little bit better than you in this area, and I'm going to focus on that. And then somebody else can come to us and say, well, I'm a little bit better than you in this area, and I'm going to focus on that. But when he's confronted with God in his absolute purity and perfection, all it does is lay everything bare because he's the standard, not one another. You see, when you're confronted with God, it exposes our own sin. It exposes our own deficiencies. And and we realize that excuses don't fly. He has no excuses. All he can do is confess. That's it. When we see God, we see the character and inner purity of God that we were made to reflect and that forces us to confront our failure to reflect it. It reveals our inner brokenness and corruption And and look at what he ties it to. I have seen the king, the Lord of hosts. So seeing God rightly is an act of grace that produces another act of grace in an effect of revealing how how far short we fall. Now, I want to get to the next point, but I want to linger here for just a minute because um, some of you might be thinking to yourself, oh, man, that's really discouraging. that does not sound fun at all. I would disagree that it's discouraging. Which is more discouraging? A life lived in self-deception and self-delusion where you think you're okay and you're not, and then finding out at the coming of Christ that you have been fooled your entire life into thinking you are a Christian, into thinking you are following Jesus when in reality you haven't, or being confronted with the reality that when we see God rightly, it produces in us a response of recognizing our own shortcomings in order that they might be dealt with. Which one of those two is more discouraging? The point is we have to be undragoned. We have to see and agree with our shortcomings before God so that the cure might be applied. I said undragoned, and that is a a term that somebody made up, but it's taken from the voyage of the Dawn Treader. Here we go, Lewis. You knew it was coming. Eustace. In Voyage of the Dawn Treader, Eustace Clarence Scrub was his name, and he actually deserved it, um, is introduced as this horrible, ugly character who constantly tears people down, who is a horrible person to be around. I mean, the kids are just, I mean, uh, Edmund and uh, Lucy are just, they're like, really, we had to come to Narnia with this guy? He, con- he is convinced that he is the smartest, bravest, and best person in the room, and when he has shown not to be, he blames someone else. It's never his fault. It couldn't possibly be. In his diary that Lewis records for us, he casts himself as this noble hero and victim of other people's incompetence and foolishness. He really is a beast. And in the voyage of the Dawn Treader, he gets turned into a dragon. But he doesn't initially know it. He's filled with fear because he thinks that he is human and he's sitting next to a dragon. And it isn't until he sees his reflection that he realizes he is the dragon. Now, why did Lewis choose a dragon? I think Lewis did it because it embodies who he really was. Lewis turned him visibly into what he was internally. And so when he sees himself as he is for the first time, it's... Utterly devastating. 
He's ugly, he's mean, he's threatening, he's frightful. Lewis writes this, he had turned into a dragon while he was asleep, sleeping on a dragon's hoard with greedy dragonish thoughts in his heart. He had become a dragon himself. And when he looks in the pool, he sees himself as he is. And what does this lead to? Seeing ourselves as we are, what does it lead to? I'll let Lewis explain. He realized that he was a monster cut off from the whole human race. An appalling loneliness came over him. He began to see that the others had not really been fiends at all. He began to wonder if he himself had been such a nice person as he had always supposed. He longed for their voices. He would have even been grateful for a kind word, even from Reepicheep. When he thought of this poor dragon that he had been, Eusus lifted, lifted up his voice and wept. A powerful dragon crying its eyes out under the moon in a deserted valley is a sight and sound hardly to be imagined. Eustace saw himself, and that led to genuine sorrow over his condition. And Lewis even highlights how bad he felt for how he acted and how he later apologized. But the point is this. Seeing rightly or seeing God rightly causes us to see ourselves rightly, which is an essential act of God's grace. Eustace had to see himself the way he was in order to be cured from who he was. And the reflection of God's glory in our own lives displays how utterly dragoned we are. And until we see how dragoned we are and feel genuine sorrow that leads to to repentance, we can never truly be undragoned. So it really isn't discouraging when we see rightly our failure and sin and shortcomings in light of God's glory and revelation of himself. It's actually essential. It's an act of God's grace and goodness in our lives. It means that God's at work in our lives. Now, if we were to stop here and not go on, I admit it would be discouraging. You would be in a dragon state and you would be mourning. But there's more. Look at verse 6. We see that God's grace removes guilt and cleanses us. And one of the seraphim flew to me, having in his hand a burning coal that he had taken with tongs from the altar, and verse 7 says, and he touched my mouth and he said, behold, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away and your sin is atoned for. So Isaiah confesses his guilt and need for deliverance. He says, I am undone. I am ruined. I am a man of unclean lips. I've seen God. I'm screwed. And God immediately brings atonement. Immediately. Immediately. This, again, is an act of God's sovereign grace. Isaiah did nothing to deserve it. He did nothing to earn it. He did not even really ask for it. He just confessed and agreed with God in repentance that he was wrong. He made no sacrifice. He made no deal with God to be a missionary if he was cleansed. He had no... Help me, St. Anne, and I will become a monk, Martin Luther moment. All he did was confess, repent, and entrust himself to the outcome. So genuine confession and repentance are empowered by God's grace and are a result, or, and result in cleansing and healing by God's grace. And so God has the coal touch Isaiah's lips, and this act cleanses Isaiah, and the seraphim announces that God has removed Isaiah's guilt and his sin is atoned for. So, that's where we all want to be, right? In order to experience that, You have to trace that back to the repentance and confession that was empowered by God's grace that flowed from the seeing God as he is that came from God revealing himself by his grace. 
So if we want repentance and, or if we want cleansing and removal of guilt that we need, we must see God as he is and see ourselves in light of that. And the third step comes after the first two. Repentance and confession lead to cleansing and a clear conscience. So was it painful for the coal to touch Isaiah's lips? Perhaps. Repentance and confession are often painful, and God's work in cleansing us can seem painful. Let me return to Eustace for a moment. When we last left him, he was dragoned and very, very sad mourning the state that he was in. Um, the question remains, how does one become undragoned? So I said we need to see ourselves as dragons, but we also need to become undragoned. The dragon, Eustace, was off on his own, and he saw a lion coming toward him. He was afraid, not of it eating him, but just of the lion. So there's something about it which is different and scary, terrifying. And the lion told Eustace to follow him, so Eustace the dragon did. And the lion told Eustace to undress. And Eustace thought, that's strange. I don't wear, I'm not wearing any clothes. But he thought, oh, wait, but I'm a dragon, so maybe I just need to shed my scales. Dragons probably shed like reptiles, and so I just need to do that. And so um, he says this. The very, uh, sorry, um, he started scratching himself, and scales started falling off. And then he went to this pool, and he saw that really nothing had changed. So he kept trying. Three more times, he tries to pull these scales, and he sees the scales, and he goes back and just sees himself as the crusty old dragon that he was. And then Lewis writes, the lion said, but I don't know if he spoke. You will have to let me undress you. I was afraid of his claws, I can tell you, but I was pretty nearly desperate now. So I just lay flat on my back to let him do it. The very first tear he made was so deep that I thought it had gone right to my heart. And when he began pulling skin off, it hurt worse than anything I'd ever felt. The only thing that made me able to bear it was just the pleasure of feeling the stuff peel off. You know, if you've ever picked a scab off a sore place, it hurts like bloody oh, but it's fun to see it coming away. Well, the peeling, well, he peeled the beastly stuff right off, just as I thought I'd done myself other three times, only they hadn't hurt. And there it was, lying on the grass, only ever so much thicker and darker and more knobbly looking than the others had been. And there was I, smooth and soft as a peeled switch and smaller than I had been. Then he caught hold of me. I didn't much like it for I was very tender underneath now that I had no skin on. And he threw me into a water. It smarted like anything, but only for a moment. After it became perfectly delicious. And as soon as I started swimming and splashing, I found all the pain gone from my arm. And then I saw why. I'd turned into a boy again. You see, we cannot cleanse ourselves. Us trying to achieve our own cleansing is like used to scratching at his own scales. It doesn't really hurt much and doesn't really have any effect. What we need to do is we need to lay on our backs like he did and let the lion tear the skin away, though it be painful. Because only then do we really have the experience of being a real child of God. God disciplines those that he loves God disciplines those that are his sons, and the discipline is meant to make us more like Christ. It is the work of God in sending the coals to touch our lips. It must be his work, and his work is an act of his grace to accomplish it. And this should lead us to swift repentance, knowing that there is God's grace and cleansing and giving a clean conscience on the other end of that. Let him just tear away. The last line by Lewis sums it up. It would be nice to, and fairly true to say that from this point forth, Eustace was a different boy. To be strictly accurate, he began to be a different boy. He had relapses. There were still many days when he could be very tiresome, but most of those I shall not notice. The cure had begun. In God's cleansing, we are able to experience new life and be changed to be more like him and reflect his character more. 
So if you want to get to a place of joy and hope, you can't skip the first two steps. And they're often painful, but there's an, a, pro, a promise and assurance of cleansing at the end. And, and listen, it's a, a freeing from guilt and shame. And Satan wants nothing more than for you to feel guilt and shame as a child of God. Really. He has no problem with you seeing God's holiness so long as it causes you to run away from God rather to in his arms. He wants you to see God's holiness and feel down on yourself and run away from the cure. That's good news for him. And some Christians actually think that guilt and shame is a Christian virtue. It's really not. Your confidence that you will be forgiven does not come from your ability. It comes solely from the basis that Christ died for you and you are trusting him and that trust drives you to him rather than away because you know that he will receive and accept you. The accuser tries to accuse day and night and we overcome by the blood of the lamb and the word of his testimony. So, Um, guilt and shame are not Christian virtues because they show an inherent misunderstanding of God's forgiveness and grace. You have nothing to be guilty of if you have repented of your sin and trusted in Christ. And when you feel the weight of sin coming down upon you, that drives you to God to experience the freedom from that. And if, when you confess and repent, you should have ringing in your ears and your hearts the words, your guilt is taken away, your sin is atoned for. And all of that is because Christ took our sin on the cross and made a way of atonement for us to be at one with this holy God. Let's pray.